All right, I have 12.59. I think I'll get us started here in just a minute. Um, I'm trying to think if I can waste any time with something else so we can wait. We'll just, we get people that are usually coming on right around 1 o'clock. So um, I guess to get started, we'll, I'll give you a couple updates. Those who didn't see, uh, there was a lot of talk about um, CMS uh, reducing the funding towards the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, that didn't happen. They, um, it's approved and finalized now that it was. They actually increased the budget by 3.2 percent. Um, so while we were hearing everything about reducing funding to the MA plans, it was actually increased. Um, so the concern when they reduce funding is that you know ancillary, the extra benefits and the advantage plans will be reduced. Um, maybe agent commissions uh, won't increase things such as that, but it looks like that's not going to be an issue this year. It doesn't mean um, that commissions will go up again for the, I think what would be the ninth year straight. Uh, we'll wait and see. That usually comes out sometime in June, but um, the funding for the program is, is there and was increased. So having said that, I think we'll get us started. So all our re seminars are recorded. If you register uh, for any of our seminars, you get the recording. So you don't even have to attend. So anybody who registers, we will email the recording out to you. Uh, if you want to watch uh, any of the old seminars or even this one, we'll have, uh, have it up later today. You can watch them all on YouTube. So that's uh, at Crow Medicare, um, or you can just Google YouTube Crow and Associates and watch all our webinars. And as I mentioned, sometimes on some of these, um, uh, subscribe if you don't mind um, so my kids will stop making fun of how many few subscribers I have that would be great um, so today we're going to talk about educational seminar best practices uh, go over our agenda quick uh, so the best practices are based on our experience the last 12 months we've done 300 head agents do 300 plus of these seminars um, I know uh, people with us myself we've attended a bunch we work with the agents and help them set them up so we have had an opportunity to see all the different things people have done and kind of made a collection of what works best for these seminars. So we'll talk about educational seminars because these are educational, not sales. How to drive attendance. We'll talk about the the right locations, the the times and dates to have the meetings, uh, the order of the meals and how they should come out, come out. Um, what materials you need for the events. Talk about the presentation itself a little bit. Um, and then how to do follow-up and the importance of follow-up. And again, when you get the email from us, you'll, you'll have a recording of this webinar. <clears throat> Last thing I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, uh, just send them in. I'm not skilled enough to, which isn't saying a whole lot for me, but I'm not skilled enough to answer questions and kind of do this, the webinar at the same time. So um, just ask your questions, and when we get done, I'll answer them for you. I think the running time of this should be about 25 minutes. So having said that, we'll get started. All right, so for our educational seminar program, um, came up with the best practices, like I said, 300 plus uh, seminars people have run in the last 12 months. We've helped with a lot of those, helped people get set up, attended a bunch of them, uh, and just based on that, have come up with a list of best practices and things to know for the seminar itself uh, when working with the vendor, follow up everything. But first, before we get there, we'll talk about difference between an educational seminar and a sales seminar, and there, it is a big difference. Educational seminars, you're allowed to serve a meal. Um, CMS allows it. They still have, though, the, the limit on the meal of $15 per person. Um, so people ask, well, why serve a meal? Well, just really to get right to the point, you serve a meal because that increases attendance by about 60%. We've had plenty of agents try to do these without a meal uh, and they just don't get the attendance. Um, so what we find though is unlike a maybe a financial planning seminar or an annuity seminar where you serve a big fancy meal and the people sometimes come to be, as we call it, a plate liquor, uh, here the meal just motivates them to show up. I mean, they're, when they come, You'll find the majority of the people, they want the information. The meal is just motivation for them to get there. But it is important nonetheless. So again, these aren't filed as sales events. They're educational events. And as a result, you don't file them like you would a, a, a sales event. Something to just be well aware of when you do 
educational seminars is you cannot bring product specific information to them. So it's educational. It has to be generic information. It can be educational approved materials that the, that the carriers have. Um, you can talk about generic information about Medicare supplement advantage plans, but you don't want to bring carrier names into it and you don't want to get plan specific benefits uh, in your seminar. And again, we have a bunch of people that have just come on. If you have any questions, just please send them in and I will, uh, I'll try to answer them for you at the end. So what can you do at an educational event versus a sales event? Um, well, you can hand out business cards and you can go over generic educational approved information or just generic information. So as long as you don't get specific, you're fine. You can give out business reply cards. Um, you can explain to the prospect why they'd want to use your services. That's something that's overlooked. Um, I, I think it's important during the seminar at least two or three or four times to kind of drive that message home of why they would want your services and the value you can provide to them. Usually at these seminars, people go over, you know, I'm going to give you a, an example of a, we have examples of generic seminars we can, or generic uh, presentations we can give you. So I'll, those are definitely available. But usually what you want to go over is original Medicare, how they enroll in Medicare, the rules, basic benefits of original Medicare, and then to some extent, uh, what an advantage plan is, what a supplement is, and the difference between the two. I like to do pros and cons of both personally. Um, but that's up to you, uh, and go over enrollment rules. And these educational seminars are geared towards T65 candidates, and that's pretty much all you will get are people turning 65. So when you do an educational T65 seminar, you're not going to get many people that are switchers. You know where you're going from advantage to advantage. These are going to be you know, people that are turning 65. All right, the biggest part about seminars is the attendance. I mean, it's really the, the most important thing. That's the trick of it. You got to have people to present to. Um, you can set up seminars, you can decide not to do a meal, um, but if you don't have people, it's it's just a waste of time. Um, so the program we have, we've been using it and it's consistent and we have a vendor um, that we use to drive the attendance. That way you don't have to worry as much about getting people to your seminar. They do it for you. Um, and and they've been proven that they will get attendance to your seminar. We're averaging 50 plus um, T65 prospects per seminar. We've had as high as 130. Uh, the agents, you certainly don't need to invite people. Not that you shouldn't. I mean, it helps. The more the merrier. Uh, it helps if you do, but um, the vendor will get the people there uh, and allow you to focus on other things if you'd like. The setup for it is once you determine your location on the time you want to do the seminar, and I'll, I'll give you feedback on that when you should do it. It's really pretty specific, but you more or less just tell our vendor, um, here's the location that we want to do it in, um, here are the days, uh, and they will create a registration portal for you and drive attendance. The portal will be specific to you in your event. And what the vendor will do is they'll send out 3,000 um, color mailers uh, with the name of the restaurant and the specifics out to T65 candidates. So they run the lists. They have all the information. They have very good lists. Um, and they will drop those invitations. So really, your role there is to tell them where it is, and they'll take care of the rest for you. Um, so they'll rely on the invitations and the Facebook posts with paid ads to drive people to your event. People always ask about the location and venue. <clears throat> um, obviously, you know, best locations are those with population densities or close to population densities. In the past, we have had lower attendance when you get into really rural areas with just sparsely populated um, sparsely populated areas. Uh, you, you really, there's got to be enough. When the vendor runs these lists, they'll let you know. They'll say, okay, well, we have easily have 3,000 people within 40 minutes of this event location, uh, no problem. Or we have a, had on a rare occasion, not that often, uh, where they have they say, well, we got to push this out further to actually get to 3,000. But they'll give you that feedback, and you can talk to them about it. Believe it or not, contrary to what we might all think, the higher net worth areas tend to draw better attendance. So you're thinking you know, more like middle middle income and higher income. Um, 
you can certainly run these in low net worth areas and they'll work. Um, but again, our best results have been where we've gotten, you know, over 100 attendees have tended to be in middle and higher and upper middle class areas. So for the location itself, restaurants are the best, um, especially a restaurant that's well known locally in the community. Like, you know, how some places have that restaurant that everybody knows about, um, those tend to be the best. And this tends to be diners, pizza places, chains. Like if you're down south, I know like Golden Corral is great. Uh, in New York, some areas, Cracker Barrel is really good or even a, a local family type restaurant. You don't need to go high end on this and you shouldn't. Um, high end restaurants are needed, fancy restaurants are needed for things like financial planning or annuity seminars. Uh, here, you, you don't need to do that. Plus, you got to remember, you've got the CMS rule of $15 per meal in place. So it really makes that not a viable option. The restaurant needs to have a separate room or area um, where you can do your presentation. Parking is certainly important. you got to do it somewhere where there's easy parking. Parking is um, something that can keep people from showing up. In price, like I said, price is important. CMS hasn't raised that $15 limit per meal in a long time. I, I you know, as we all know, inflation has definitely gone up, um, and we we're hopeful they'd raise that someday, but they certainly haven't done it yet. When you're finding your venue, the the strongest recommendation I can give is to meet them in person. Um, people sometimes tend to get on the phone and call, and you can do that initially, uh, but really you should meet with them. And the whole reason for doing that is because when you meet with them, you can give them a pitch and you can let, let them know that there's going to be, we're going to be advertising for them for free. Um, they're going to have 3,000 mailers with the restaurant's name on it that'll go out. You're going to be bringing 50 plus new people to the restaurant. Um, and you're choosing their venue, their location, and they're going to benefit from all of that. So that usually is a good segue into seeing if they can help you out with the cost per meal price. And oftentimes they will. Uh, if you pitch it correctly, Meet, versus if you just call them on the phone and say, hey, I want to do this meeting here, you know, that might not get you quite as far. So you really got to pitch it and explain the value of it to them. In general, and there's exceptions to every rule, of course, but in general, private clubs, country clubs, and banquet facilities don't draw as well. So we usually say to stay away from those types of places. All right, best times and days. So the best times and days to do these seminars are Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you, you want to do it. These people are working. Most of them are working because they're turning 65. You want to do a dinner meeting 6 or 6.30 p.m. So Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 or 6.30, do not do lunch meetings. I know we've had people try them. Our own vendor sometimes suggests, hey, how about a lunch meeting? Stay away from them. I just talked over my own slide. Uh, the other days to stay away from are Mondays. Mondays don't seem to do well on Fridays, obviously, because people sometimes have plans for the weekend or whatever. Uh, so Tuesdays and Thursdays are the best. Um, I mentioned two days because if you do one seminar, you're going to need at least two dates. So, you know, you set up one seminar with the vendor. Uh, they're going to drive attendance, but you're going to need enough people where you can't usually use one meeting date to accommodate all of them. So you set two. And that should be a Tuesday and Thursday in the same week. I always recommend to have a day in between them. Uh, the reason for that is because when you do these seminars, you will have the registration portal, and it's very good. It'll have all their contact information and everyone that registers. You really need to have a day in between when you call them because you need to call. Is the people registered the day before the event? You should call them. So on Monday, you're going to be calling your all your people that registered for Tuesday, confirming they're coming, making sure they know where it is. If you want, you could see if there's any dietary restrictions. Uh, and then on Wednesday, you've got a lot of calling to do because on Wednesday, you want to do follow-up calls for all the Tuesday people, and you've got to confirm all the Thursdays. So that's usually why we like to have a day in between. And the other reason for that is because on those who registered but didn't show up for your Tuesday, you can call them and say, hi, I, you know, I noticed you couldn't make the Tuesday meeting, but we're having another one on Thursday. Maybe you can make that one. So that's why I always recommend a day in between. Also, feel free to call the ones that registered but didn't attend as well. So maybe there's some that didn't show up on Tuesday. You call them and let them know they can come Thursday if they want. But ultimately, you get some Tuesdays and Thursdays that don't attend. 
call all of them. You want to do follow up with all of them. Uh, we have a lot of agents that ultimately write people that never came to either seminar. When you have this registration portal um, and the links created specific for you, you can limit the attendance per day. So if you have a small location, you can limit it to say 30 people a day. If you do that, you might want to add a third date, which you can do. Um, or you know maybe you just don't in general want to have more than 40 people, so you can limit it to 40. And what will happen is when Tuesday fills up, and usually the first date on the event fills up first, when Tuesday fills up, it will block them from attending and just give them the only option is Thursday. If Thursday fills up, then you need to probably add an additional day the following week. So it can be adjusted and it can limit attendance. And I usually tell people I wouldn't go much over 40. If you get over 40 people at your your presentation, uh, it gets a little unruly and it's hard to give attention to all of them because you know how it goes. You always get a couple people that are going to ask a million questions and try to dominate all your time so you can't get to the others. And as I mentioned before, sometimes you need to add an additional day or two. That's why it'll be important to keep checking the portal to see how many people are registered. Uh, if you're filling up on the second day, then you can call the vendor and say, hey, I'm adding a third date. You got to talk to the restaurant as well. And hopefully they have the following Tuesday or Thursday available so you can add an additional date. I do see a lot of people, there are some questions coming in, and again, I, I know I got some people that got, just came on recently. I will answer those at the end for you. Okay, so a lot of questions about the meals. <clears throat> We've had, and I personally even, I was a seminar person, so I personally have tried different cadences with the meals, and what we found out is that really the best one is the following one. So when people get there, you're going to have a registration list um, of everybody that registered for the event. You can print that out and bring it with you. So if they get there, you can check off if they attended or not. And then you're basically going to have them be able to, either there'll be drinks or they can order a drink at the table and have maybe salad or bread or maybe just the drink. Some people have nothing else. Um, when they start to file in and sit down, you can let them know that you're going to do the presentation. You're going to stress to them that it's going to be a brief presentation. Uh, and you can tell them once the presentation is done, then the meal will come out. And then once everybody's settled, you'll open it up for questions. And you'll answer questions once everybody's settled and they're eating the meal. This gives you a lot of opportunity to answer questions, first of all. And secondly, it gives you a, a good chance to walk around and talk to everybody. And, you know, potentially make appointments, answer questions, um, and, and just have plenty of time. And, and the meal is what keeps them there so they won't just file out before you get a chance to talk to them. We usually do recommend not doing a seminar by yourself. It's nice if you've got, it doesn't necessarily have to be another licensed person, but just another person there. Um, I know like myself, uh, people that work with us, they we often will attend seminars and help people if they don't have an extra person. Okay, so what kind of materials can you have for the event? Well, obviously business cards. You want to have business cards out. Um, but a folder or some kind of handouts with your contact information on them is suggested. The reason is it's very easy for people to lose business cards and given the way people are today, they might come to your seminar, think it's great information and say to themselves, oh, I'd, I'd really like to give Bob a call. He did a great job, but I lost his card and I don't have his contact information. So a business card, a folder, you don't have to have a folder, but that's certainly nice. A folder or some kind of handouts um, with your contact information on them um, is important. You can give business reply cards out at these events. A business reply card is just saying, yes, you know, I'm giving you permission to call me. I definitely would say to have those or some kind of appointment sheet. You know, a one pager, you can just make it if you want with your contact info on it. But saying, you know, the person fills in their name and says, yes, I'd like somebody to contact me. I'd like to make an appointment. Um, sometimes you can put the option in there. Maybe they want to do a phone call or meet in person and they put all their information in there. Uh, and they can fill that out, and then you can collect them at the end. I usually recommend doing these on a projector, so you're going to run a PowerPoint, um, bring your own. Um, a lot of locations will let, sometimes let you rent one, but they charge a fortune, so you're better off having your own projector. We have a couple of them here that can be available if somebody else isn't using it. Uh, but ultimately, if you're going to try this and do it long term, I'd suggest getting your own. They're not that expensive. Um, and you then on the projector, you can either project this on the wall 
or if you're at a place that just doesn't have nice smooth surface, you know, an area where you can project it, um, you can get a screen um, that sticks on the wall. You can get those from Walmart or Amazon. Some people have the stand-up screens, and my only issue with those is often they're not tall enough um, to project the, the PowerPoint up high enough, so I like the ones that stick on the wall better. In the portal, you can print a registration list. You definitely need to do that. So you print out the list of who's going to reg who registered, have it at the meeting, so then when you get there, you can ask them their name, and you can check off if they attended or not. That way you'll, find, you'll know who attended. I, some of the first seminars I used to do, um, you know, I'd find myself doing follow-up calls uh, with everybody, and I couldn't remember if they came or not. And sometimes if you have a just a blank registration list, maybe they didn't fill it out. So I, I like pre-printing the registration from the portal out. That way you know who was there. For the presentation itself, we have a sample presentation uh, that you can use. We can send that to you. You can tweak it. Uh, and then we have a graphics department that can personalize it to you. So we certainly have a sample presentation. It's been tweaked a little over the years, but it's um, I think it's it's one of the better ones. Feel free to use what you want or some variation of ours. These presentations, the critical thing is just to cover the basics. So how to get Medicare A and B, because these people are turning 65 and they won't know things like, oh, I, I'm drawing Social Security, I'm going to get automatically enrolled, or you know, I'm not drawing Social Security, I have to manually apply. So you want to have those basics and the basic benefits of A and B. And then you want to go over supplements versus advantage plans and the presentation, the sample one we have, it gives the pros and cons. I like giving that um, and go over enrollment rules. And built into there, you want to have the role of the, of the agent. So believe it or not, a lot of people will think maybe you're going to charge them so you can let them know you won't and let them know that you know, this is good general information for you to know, but each person's situation is specific. And you're going to find out what kind of plan fits best for their specific situation. You know, an insurance company isn't going to do that for them. You know, it's naive for them to think if they're working with a specific company or take a plan from that company, if that company is no longer offering the best rate on a supplement or the best benefits on an advantage plan, do they really think that the company is going to tell them? Unfortunately, sometimes people have told me yes, that they think they would do the right thing and tell them, but you get my point. More or less, what you're doing is explaining to them why it's important and why they need you as an agent. With the presentation, the presentation itself should be no more than 40 minutes uh, at the max. Ideally, you want it to be more like 30. The shorter, the better. Um, the, one of the Biggest mistakes you can make is having a presentation that's an hour long. It, it will turn people off. They'll check out um, before you get finished. So 40 minutes tops, 30 minutes ideally. With the seminar, the most in, obviously the, the most important thing is having people there. Probably the next most important thing is the follow-up. Keep in mind, these people are turning 65 in the next month to seven months. You need to stay in touch with them. You've got to follow up. There's, you, gotta really, you really should stay in touch with them monthly until they get to the range where they can enroll three months out from turning 65. You, know, you use phone calls. You're going to be calling them initially to confirm that they're coming to the meeting. You're going to call them after the meeting. Uh, but then you want to stay in touch with emails, phone calls, to stay in touch with them. Some of these people will still be working. Um, we have agents that enroll people a year after a seminar because the people were working and they weren't ready yet. Um, com it's very common for people to be doing enrollments three, four, five months after a seminar. So follow-up is the biggest differentiator of results. So an agent that's does a good, puts on a good seminar and does good follow-up, they should get, and they usually get, 15 to 20 enrollments ultimately from that seminar. Certainly, they won't get them all initially. Um, it'll take three, four, five months, but that's where they'll end up. Um, and you should track and see how you're doing. And also, if you do good follow-up, you'll get enrollments even from people that registered but never even attended. Some other things to know. When you do a T65 seminar, these are new to Medicare's, remember, so it's a new MA sale. You're going to be getting full commission. Uh, regardless of the effective date, it will not be prorated, so it's going to be the CMS Max Commission, not prorated, and your renewal is going to start in January. So in, in a way, 
the later in the year you do these, the more you're going to get paid um, because regardless of the effective date, the renewal is starting in January. You can run these things all year round, which is nice. We have some people that do run them all year, 12 months a year. As I mentioned, full commission, it's not prorated. <clears throat> mentioned the renewals. Um, you'll want to get the vendor, the vendor, you'll want to get the registration portal landing page that's specific to you when it's ready. Because when you get set up to do a seminar and they're getting ready to set your invites out, they'll create that landing page specific to you. And you can use that yourself if you want. You could email it out to uh, prospects you have, see if they want to come to a seminar. Uh, maybe you have people turning 65 in another book of business. You could email it out to them. Uh, and they can register for your seminar. So you want to get that, that portal from the vendor uh, once they have it ready. You also want to send it out to us into Pinnacle because we can run Facebook ads for you. Um, and we'll do a paid ad for you for this as well to help drive people. People always get worried about setup um, and help and knowing how to do these. Um, we certainly um, help people with the setup. We can, even in most cases, attend your first seminar if you're not comfortable. Um, so we definitely have support for you with these. Okay, let's hit the cost. So what's the cost to do this thing? So we have the best pricing with our vendor. We have a, a, a very good promotional price with them because we do so many of these with them. Uh, the cost to run a seminar is $2,400. Now, I mentioned people get confused. That's $2,400 covers regardless of how many nights you are going to run it. That will get you your 50 plus 50 to 60 people at your seminar, whether it's over one, two, or three nights. So it's $2,400. Crow will split the cost for your first one. So we'll pay $1,200 of that. You just set it up. You pay the vendor. Send us the receipt. We'll reimburse you 50%. And then ongoing seminars will reimburse you $50, uh, $500 towards future seminars. But then you also have the meal cost. So obviously, you got to keep the meal $15 or less. Um, you'll have that cost. And that's where the carriers have been huge. Um, you really, for the seminar, should pick a carrier where you know, they have a plan that you would tend to sell them the most. You want to talk to them, and they've been more than willing to help out with the meal costs and, in most cases, pay for all of it. So that would, that would be an expense you don't have. Uh, if you then are able to write cases for them enough, um, then they will ongoing help you with these costs. The carriers like these programs a lot because it's new people. They're turning 65. They like those enrollments, and they've been really willing to help out um, with the meal costs on these events. $125 is the number to remember. So when you ask a carrier for money, and that's why I said it's important to pick one that you're going to write, when you ask them for money, they're going to be looking internally, and there's variations here, some a little less, some a little more, but they're going to want to see a sale for about every $125 they give you. That's, so that's how you do the math internally in your head. And some people will say, well, I brought them a bunch of supplements, and qu quite frankly, they don't count. Uh, they're looking for MA. That's that's where they get their what their funding is for. And so if you're going to ask you know, a carrier for money, you just got to do the, the math in your head and say, all right, I'll divide that by 125, and that's about how many enrollments they're looking for from me. Big question comes in, is it worth it? So people tend to, the answer is yes, but people tend to look at the cost of the seminar and say, well, that's expensive. And I always try to remind them, you got to really look at the CPA, the cost per acquisition. I get plenty of people that work mail, and nothing against mail, it works fine. But if you look at somebody, maybe they're paying a little less for the mailers or they're buying online leads and paying a little less but over the long term, how much are you paying and how many enrollments are you getting? Because really what it comes down to is how much money are you spending and how many enrollments are you ultimately getting? Cost per acquisition. So quick example on mailers. Mailers run about five fifty per thousand. Um, let's assume a two percent response rate, which is actually generous in some cases. We're not always you're not always getting that. In some cases you can do a lot worse than that. Uh, like if you try to do a mailer of people turning sixty five in the next six months, you're gonna get maybe a percent. Um, but anyway, I'm trying to be fair with the comparison. Let's say somebody does 4,000 piece mailer, 2% response, they're getting 80 leads for about 2,200 bucks, then assume a 10% close rate. And some people say, well, you close higher than that. No, not in most cases. There certainly are some outliers that will 
have a better close rate than that. But on average, you know, people are happy with about 10% on mailers. So that would be about eight sales. So 2,200 bucks for eight sales. Um, now you could do non T65 mailers, but the problem with them is you're going to get a lot of people that are already on a plan and it's an MA to MA. And when you write that, you're going to get half, you're going to get half the commission and it's prorated. So if you're writing them later in the year, it's going to be very small commission amounts. Yes, you're going to get the renewal, um, but initially you're not going to get a lot. Or if you look at our seminar, for example, um, leaving aside the fact that we cover half of the first one, even after that, worst case scenario, we're putting 500 towards it for you. So that's $1,900. And let's assume you get 50 people, um, but the carriers will help you or pay for all of this. But we'll just throw that into the equation. Even worst case scenario here, you're spending $2,650 for 15 new sales. I mean, being more realistic with this, because your cost would be a lot less because we're covering half of the first one, and the carriers are going to help you with that meal. So I gave worst case scenario here, but the math still works. Uh, so yes, the running seminars are worth it. And the fact of the matter is you can run them year-round, and you can run them where you want. So you can control kind of the flow of it, control when you have them, um, and know what you're going to get. That is all I had. So I appreciate it. I'm going to look at the questions here and answer those for you. I will send this recording out. We'll email it out to everybody that registered. Or you can watch them on YouTube at Crow Medicare. Um, and let's see what we have for questions. Okay, let's see. Uh, secret shoppers. I told... Uh, yeah, so you won't often... These are educational, so they're not filed. You don't have to file an educational event. Um, so they won't often be secret shop. I mean, does that mean they never can? No, but it's not a sales event. So the, the tendency would be would be much lower um, for these to be secret shop, but they certainly could be. Uh, somebody said they can't find a place for $15 with drink and tax. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the biggest struggle is finding the location. Uh, we've certainly had many people you know like i said we did 300 plus of these in the last 12 months and everybody struggles with the location but ultimately we have i haven't had anybody yet who ultimately hasn't been able to find one so um you can do it you got to go and you've got to really pitch them on the the free advertising piece and it, sh it and it could happen you could you can find a location if you do that so maybe that's the piece that's missing uh if not, then you certainly can give myself or Serena or Stephanie a call. We'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, what is the estimated you will write four to? F Let me read this one. What is the estimated you will write four to five Medicare Advantage plans within a week after the seminar? It depends. I mean, sometimes people make. Uh, I just had an agency that did their Tuesday and Thursday seminar, and I think they booked like 21 appointments. So they wrote more than that. Um, usually you will, um, but over the course of three or four or five months, you ultimately get around 20 enrollments. Let's see what else we have for questions. We have a lot of questions. Let me see what we have. Is there a rigid presentation CMS requires we use? No. It's educational. So as long as the information is generic, you can present what you want. Again, we have an example presentation that's the one a lot of people use. Uh, and you can tweak it if you want a little bit. I wouldn't tweak it too much, though, because the one we have is works very well, uh, and then we can personalize the whole thing to you if you want. Uh, do we have to have each seminar pre-approved or pre-registered with CMS? No. Let's see. Somebody sent me a question on an unrelated topic. I think I'll, I'll come back to that, or maybe you can um, send me a, a, that question some other time, just I don't want to hit it today, because if it's not related, then I'm kind of trying to stick to the the seminar theme here. Uh, let's see. Uh, can we compliantly introduce a brief overview of middle income estate planning wills and trusts? That's a good topic. Um, you could. As long as you don't get specific, you could mention it. However, you got to be careful. I've had some seminars have been hurt badly because people have talked about too many other things or talked too long about it. It tends to turn people off a bit. They came. It, this was advertised as a Medicare seminar. Uh, you should really stick to that. Uh, you could make a brief mention of other services, but the time to do that really would be on the follow-up. So after you meet with them, 
close them on the Medicare plan, then you could talk to them about other services um, that you could set an additional appointment and talk about. So I would try to keep it to a minimum at your seminar. Uh, let's see. Somebody, oh, good, good one. Somebody mentioned New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Um, the, sometimes it depends on where. They're asking, do the invites need to go out further? Um, sometimes they do. Um, but believe it or not, you do have a fairly decent T65 population in those states and some migratory T65 population in those states. Um, so it, it really depends on where you are. Um, but people are willing to travel. Um, and we tend to think with these that, okay, you know, these are Medicare people. They won't drive. They won't travel. Well, no, most of these people are working. I mean, they're used to driving. So, you know, you can get people will travel 40 minutes, 50 minutes even. To come to these seminars so usually we can accommodate it unless you're in even for like new hampshire vermont or maine a very rural area but the vendor will help you with that and they'll help you come up with the list and run the numbers for you will the carrier pay the meal cost up front before the seminar or when do they pay no usually they'll pay you um like the day of the seminar or after the fact uh, let's see what else do we have for questions? Uh, Ed, do you think most prospects realize that they are not going to pay any more in monthly premium for any product, including ACA, by going through an agent versus doing it on their own? No. I, I mean, many of them know that, but a lot don't. Um, and it's worth mentioning. Um, it's, mention to them, you don't charge anything, and the, the product is the same, and it's the same cost with or without you. I usually use the example with them and say, has anybody worked with a, an auto and home agent? It's the same price with or without them, but they can help you find the carrier with the, the best benefits at the best price. And a lot of people, that resonates with them. All right, let's see what, a few more questions here. Um, if you're with a new carrier, will they help you with meal costs up front? It's... A lot of times they want to see that you've been writing, you know, because it's a matter of do they believe you that you're going to write? However, if you're a proven producer with other, with carriers, you know, other carriers with that product and you show them that and talk to them about it, they, they might be more convinced of that. Somebody said, thanks for the interview, uh, overview. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, somebody said, what about if you tend to see a lot of SUPs? How can you get carrier support? It's a great question. It's hard to. Um, some carriers, um, the blues, for example, especially in the state you're in in New York, um, they will tend to, to count supplements a bit more, um, but a lot of your other big name brand carriers, they just supplements, it's not part of their their uh, kind of what they get judged by. So it, it's hard then. Um, usually you gotta you gotta try to drum up enough of advantage plans to to make it work for them. But there are a few carriers. There's one specifically, like I said, in New York that they do count supplements. So you probably know who I'm talking about. Um, so they might be a good a good target for you. Okay, so, oh yeah, I forgot. This is a good question too because I forgot to mention it. How many weeks prior to your meeting do you suggest advertising for your meeting? Um, well, let's go by the vendor for a minute. You really want to have your location and plan about six weeks ahead with the vendor. So you have your event location. You want to give that vendor about six weeks to get set up, get everything ready. Um, so then as far as advertising for your event, um, you know, I don't know if you can advertise too early because if you get people to register, you're going to be able to call them and remind them anyway. Uh, and quite frankly, your registration link probably won't be ready until, you know, three or four weeks before the event. But, um, yeah, I would say in general, you know, three, four weeks before and, and then when it, you know, closing in on the event. Okay, so somebody just said they have a, a seminar in Maine next week, uh, and there's 30 people um, for both nights. They did a normal six-week window, so they got 60 people coming um, for that seminar, and that's in Maine. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, thanks for answering the questions. Thanks, Ed. Okay, looks like that's all we have for questions. I'll just give another minute here to see if there's any others. It looks like that's it. So really appreciate you coming on today. I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, anybody, we're going to have a Zoom meeting tomorrow. That's an open forum uh, where we can just answer questions and everybody can interact. 
Uh, tomorrow, feel free to join if you'd like. Uh, that's at 1 o'clock. And other than that, hopefully I'll see you next week on the seminar. I don't know the topic yet. If anybody has suggestions, feel free to send them to me if you have suggestions for a seminar topic for next week. Other than that, I appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great day.